This is the Let's Connect with Leslie O'Hare podcast. Your host, Leslie O'Hare, dating and conflict resolution coach, TV personality, TEDx speaker, and author created this podcast to ignite a spark of excitement that will immediately educate, motivate, empower, and inspire you to live your best life. Let's Connect is more than a talk show. It's a conversation show. Let's have a conversation. Here's Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. (laughs) I am so happy to be here with you today for the Let's Connect with Leslie O'Hare talk show. You know, every week, the past two weeks, I explain to you why I decided to create this podcast. Most of you know me as a TV host, uh, radio personality, dating and conflict resolution coach. And I wanted to see how can I transition the on-camera TV studio Uh, experience into this great podcast. And when I was thinking about the name Let's Connect, I decided to really embrace that name because in our society today, we're really not connecting because we have the pandemic. We have so many other catastrophic things that we're seeing every day on the news where it's preventing us as families, as couples, as employer employees uh, from connecting and having conversations. So what is better way to do this than to have a podcast where I always say it's not a talk show, it's a conversation show. So every week that I'm live with you is to have a conversation on various topics. It may be health, it may be politics. Sometimes it's just going to be the two of us just talking, me talking to you. And every time there's going to be a different segment. And today we have an amazing segment, which is called the Her Time to Rise Up segment. And that was birthed as an extension of my women's conference that I do every single year with these amazing speakers. And that conference is called She Rise Up. So Her Time to Rise Up is about heroic, empowering risk takers. And boy, do I have a woman on this show today that truly represents every bit of what Her Time to Rise Up stands for. And her name is Dawn Freeman. You will meet Dawn in just a few moments, and uh, there's her beautiful photo. You'll meet her in just a few moments, and she's going to talk to us about her company, which is called Fourth Dawn, and I'll tell you a little bit about her on the other side of our commercial break. During the commercial, I'm giving you an insight, a little shot into the She Rise Up conference, because I really want you to have a clear understanding as to why it was so important to take that in-person women's conference transition into the podcast to empower and inspire women to be everything you were created to be. So let's take a look at that. And on the other side of the commercial, we're going to come back with Ms. Dawn Freeman back in a moment. She Rise Up. Absolutely love the music. Amazing performers. The speakers were so inspirational. I feel empowered. I feel ready to rise. She Rise Up. I am so, so inspired. I'm hyped. I probably won't be able to go to sleep when I get home. I enjoyed the show so much. The concerts, everything was so uh, uplifting. I was so blessed to be a part of this incredible event because I feel like women need to hear other women sharing their stories 
so that they can be encouraged to continue on and then use their own stories of, of um, trial and triumph to help heal a broken world around us. It's very important and uh, you know meaningful for women to get together on a regular basis, not only to encourage each other, but to share our stories and our challenges, the good, the bad, the ugly, so that we know that we're not alone in our struggles, whether it's our family members, our husbands, our children, our partners, our jobs, our careers. We matter and we're able to overcome those things and we need to lock arms with each other and move forward and rise up together. So you got a really clear picture and you saw Miss Dawn Freeman. She was one of the speakers that night that was in 2019. And so it is so amazing to have had the opportunity to inspire all those beautiful women. And today, as I said, we have Dawn Freeman. She is the CEO of Fourth Dawn. Hi, Dawn. How are you? Hi. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I'm sorry we're not in studio with this pandemic. <laughs> I know. It's okay. We we know how to improvise. <laughs> As women, we have to pivot, right? Exactly. So let me tell everyone about this beautiful woman. Dawn is the CEO of Fourth Dawn. She's also a sought after speaker who has become a champion for marginalized groups. And she works vigorously within social justice and also with the community level change. And with Fourth Dawn, she really created this company with different training methods in mind and social justice expertise, as well as having it to be a platform where people can really, as Dawn said, walk the talk of social justice. So Dawn, you know, let's delve right into this great topic and a uh, very important topic. When you decided to start for Dawn, what was the, what, first of all, what are some of the services and then what really motivated you to start this company? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, Leslie, thank you for having me on. And I was just smiling when I watched that clip of us. Um, I remember that night extremely well. Um, it was an amazing event. I just encourage all of your viewers, if you have not um, seen or participated, especially for women, please join uh, Leslie's, um, you know, the opportunity when she does it again for this year um, and for next year, just continue to go. It's a, a great opportunity to just really come together with like-minded women that are striving to, to go to that next level. Um, Fourth Dawn. That. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, Fourth Dawn was actually born out of, you know, it, it wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. So I, I created this LLC last year. I, I formed the company last year from the perspective of wanting to consult um, and consult and helping different corporations and organizations um, to be able to really move forward and actually do something tangible to impact the lives of people um, impacted by the justice system or you know whether it any cause it could be gender equality it could be homelessness it could be education just whatever the cause is do something that was the original vision just to consult um, I also am the uh, founder and chairperson for a nonprofit by the name of Region Hope Initiative um, it's been in um, existence now for a little bit over four years so very excited about that but um, you know it the LLC really marries or is coupled very well with the work that I do with the nonprofit. So from a nonprofit perspective, I really focus on reentry efforts, criminal justice reform, um, looking to impact and impact and influence uh, policy at the federal and state level as well as local local level, um, being involved with voting for judges and a, 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 a number of things, right? Um, but complementary to that. Once you prepare someone um, who's transitioning from incarceration and they return to the community, is the community really well suited and prepared to support them? And the answer is no. Um, there are limitations, there are biases and myths and expectations that exist out there, not just for employers and community partners, but when it comes to renting, um, 
leveraging public transportation. I mean, just pick any particular challenge or barrier that you think somebody can face um, coming out no. of the situation. Right. No. Yeah. Exactly. Um, any one of those barriers and add about 30,000 more to them, right? So there are these things called co collateral consequences. So there's, you know, from 40, 30 to 40,000 barriers that people that are impacted by the justice system, meaning they have a felony on their record, um, that they are just shut out of um, or, you know, are prohibited from obtaining licensing, whether it's to be a barber or a cosmetologist or um, to go to school, higher education, not being able to take advantage of Pell Grant. Some of some of these types of things that we who are not, you know, have don't have that F stigma on us, felon, um, don't face, but they face them every day. Uh, and so I really marry the two together. So from a nonprofit perspective, providing direct services and outreach directly to people who are impacted by the system, but then also from an LLC perspective, really helping to support and collaborate with um, employers and housing providers and other nonprofits, faith-based organizations to really look at what they're doing, evaluate their practices and policies to make it more ecumenical for individuals impacted by the system as one dynamic. There's many more. <laughs> you know, well, when you talk about individuals who are incarcerated, I know I've spoken at some of your events, so we've done work yes. many times together before. One of the things I really like about you, Dawn, when yes. someone's incarcerated, I remember uh, one of your workshops that, that you had in Cleveland, Ohio. One of the things you said to each and every one of us, the speakers and your entire team, you were very intentional about what how we reference someone who is incarcerated. Absolutely. Not to say someone who's in prison or an inmate, but loved one. Correct. And I love that because I think oftentimes as a society, we do have a stereotype to someone who's been in prison, who's been incarcerated. We have a standoffish type of personality or attitude toward them, not really understanding that I think everybody deserves a second chance. I think a lot of times we all make mistakes. And as you know, there's so many people in prison right now who are completely innocent yeah. and they are there by no fault of their own, you know? Yeah. And so to have an organization like yours to come out into the community and empower and educate the communities and the families to say, let's stand together because when they come out, if we don't help them, who's going to help them? Exactly. And if we don't help them get the job, if we don't help them know how to utilize the computers and technology and things like that, then what's going to happen? We're setting them back up for failure. We're setting them up, them up for failure. Right. And so to be able to have those tools at their fingertip for what you provide, I think is amazing. And, and you always have such an instrumental team that backs you because no one can do it by themselves. That's and with right. that in mind, you talk a lot about sustainable cultures of social justice. What exactly Correct. is sustainable culture of social justice? Well, and, and you you honed in, and I, this is why I love you, right? You honed in on what what it's really all about. Sustainability means being intentional. It's not a one and done kind of thing. Um, you know, intentionality in every aspect of your life, and and I can even put it in the context of my own journey, of you know wanting to achieve or live a certain lifestyle. But in order to live that lifestyle, I had to do certain things and achieve certain goals in order to reach that point. And it was all intentional. It wasn't an epiphany. It didn't just magically fall in my lap that, oh, I'm going to live here or get a degree. You start a plan, you, you know, register, you research schools, you register for school, you take the classes, and then you graduate. So it's um, someone else always describes it like uh, someone doesn't win, the, win a gold medal in the Olympics by accident. Like they just wake up one morning, I'm going to go to the Olympics and win. No, they train, they prepare. Well, that is the, the same is true when it comes to social justice, regardless to what area or niche you want to focus on. You have to be intentional. You ha it has to be thought out and you have to make real, you know, thoughtful steps towards bringing about whatever that change is, whether it's culturally within the walls of the organization or something you're doing in the community. It has to be intentional. It won't happen through osmosis. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it won't be. And and I think in life, that's such a very big word 
intentional. It seems like a small word, but it's very big. We have to be intentional, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's as a owning our own company, whatever it is that we really, really want to succeed at in life, you have to be intentional. The analogy that you use with the gymnast that goes and wins the gold medal, yes. they had to be very intentional, as you said, to work very hard. And with hard work comes hard knocks. Exactly. And that comes never, ever giving up. Yes. I want to talk a bit about, you have eight core tenets Correct. with Fourth Dawn. And yes. those are impact, you have professional, integrity, empathy, persistence, yes. diversion and inclusion, and you also have engagement. Yes. And I think every single one of them, and I don't know if I left out professional, um, they're very integral parts. Can you elaborate on those for us a little bit? And why is it so intricate? Why are those core tenets intricate to Fourth Dawn? Yeah, well, the the first thing is, and I'm glad you brought that, you know, you, you mentioned this one, is the integrity, right? Do what you say you're going to do um, and, and have standards with it. You know, no ulterior motive, no outside gain that you're looking for. But especially when you're doing this work, this hard work, this, you know, sometimes heart tugging, difficult work, you have to have integrity with that. And, and, and from an integrity perspective, what grounds me is my, my belief system. I, I'm, I am a Christian. I'm a Christian woman. And, and my beliefs really ground and guide me. So understanding, you know, we always hear this. Um, for those who are Christians, you may hear this in the church. Like the blood is on your hands if you, you know, do something wrong or, or out of place or out of pocket. Because you have to remember these are real souls. These are lives. And even thinking about it in the context of, you know, making the difference in one person's life. Yeah, that may be one that you're interacting with personally, but they have family members, they have children, they have people in their life sphere that they're influencing. So your impact is beyond just the one individual. It's touching all these other individuals that are also tied to this person. Um, and so impact you know, while most people just count the one number, well, Dawn, you talked to Leslie and now Leslie counted as one. Well, Leslie has a family. Leslie has an audience. Leslie has a business. You know, there's all these other people that through my one interaction, whether it be for a short period of time or for a longer engagement, is going to impact and influence. If I'm doing my job appropriately and, and sharing what, you know, from my heart um, in the right way, it's going to reach all of those individuals. And so keeping that in mind, you know, when it gets into engagement, you have to be involved. You can't put your, bury your head in the sand. Um, I, one of the big areas, and, and I know it's somewhat controversial, may, maybe just a little bit, and I had to fix my chair for whatever reason, I kept sliding down here. So, <laughs> you know, pop back up. Um, but when it comes to engagement, one of the things that I also advocate for, especially in, you know, black and brown communities is getting involved in the political aspects of what's going on at a local and a state level. Um, typically, most people only see political engagement as, you know, vote for the president. Well, that's one thing, right? That's one thing. There's, you know, the electoral college and all this other stuff. So it gets more involved. But at the end of the day, we don't really pick the president anyway. Um, so, you know, beyond that. Right. What can you do? How can you get involved from a civic perspective um, and impact and have an influence on your local community and your state? So whether that's voting for the judges that may be seeing, you know, hearing cases that are, um, it could impact your loved ones or your neighbors or someone that you work with, um, to electing your state representatives who are policymakers. So when these new laws and things come about, again, it doesn't happen through osmosis. A lot of times it happens right in front of our faces. But because we're not actively engaged or involved in the process, we only know about it when we're on the receiving end in a negative way right. and you know from a community perspective it's just getting involved being involved and you know register to vote so you can be on a jury absolutely right so you can be on a jury don't ignore your jury summons and right. yes maybe it's an inconvenience and it doesn't pay a whole lot but again if you 
Right. If you embrace empathy, what you do, your action, action or inaction impacts your neighbor, your loved one. And so when you see injustice or unfair sentencing or, you know, unfair probation or parole guidelines or whatever the case may be, you could have had some impact had you been involved in, you know, civic engagement and your civic duty in that way. And and, and to really kind of bring it home. You know, we have ancestors and people in our not too recent past who gave their lives for our right to vote, um, for our rights to be able to do some of the things that we take for granted today. I know things that I know I feel like my children take for granted, uh, the sacrifices that I've made for them to live a certain lifestyle and in a certain type of community setting, whether ideal or not, you know, it's a move for, you know, forward and it's honoring their their sacrifices and their struggle and, and what they did um, for us to be able to have a voice to have a vote and have a seat at the table like really taking that to heart and understanding that and I think that a lot of times people don't think they have a voice they don't think their vote really really counts they but they complain and I always say if you're gonna mm-hmm. complain then vote. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, then don't complain, live with it. But right. we do have such power whenever we vote. And we know a lot of our voting rights are trying to be taken away from us. And unfortunately, but we it is power. It is our voice. We are, we are able to take a stance on something that we believe in. And I don't think it's something that we should be judgmental to someone about. I think we have that right. We should embrace that right. And one thing you said, even in our local community, because I think oftentimes when we talk about voting, we think that, oh, let's vote. It's election for the president. But we do have those local, those I call them the smaller voting opportunities, which really aren't small at all. Yep. Because I do want to know that I have a great judge in my community that's for the people and all of the other electoral uh, votes that we can vote for in the people right. and really taking the time to research our community and see when those voting opportunities are coming up, but also taking the time to learn and research the people that are running. Don't exactly. just vote for someone because you just like their name or because someone else says it. Do your own research. It's like right. being a Christian and going to church or like the vaccine. Do your own research. Empower yourself. Power is knowledge. And don't let anyone take that away from you. But I'm so glad that you took the time to uh, motivate or encourage the audience when we have these opportunities, go out there and utilize your voice. I mean, there's nothing like having a voice. And as women, you know, um, I had Judy Hoberman on last week and we talked about walking on the glass floor, basically how women, we've come so far, but we have so much further to go. Men try to take our voice away in corporate America and in business. And when we have an opportunity, especially as women to have a voice, utilize it, take advantage of it. Absolutely. No, and so, One of the things I also want to talk about with Fourth Dawn, you have your community justice working process, which Mm -hmm. you have developed a three-part framework change for this, which is social justice, Mm -hmm. social responsibility, social service, and and community social justice. So tell us a little bit about this three-part framework. Um, I think it's very essential, very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I'm I'm so glad you picked up on that. So, um, it, the three the three legged stool, right, is made up of social responsibility, social service, and then social justice. So, social responsibility is you being responsible for you, doing your part, whether that's you know, um, you know, just being friendly to someone, doing doing your job, interacting with other individuals when you know, just again personal responsibility we we always think about it and we've heard of corporate response corporate you know responsibility but then there's individual responsibility of how you interact with other individuals and being mindful embracing the empathy factor and seeing yourself in another person's shoes that's social responsibility and not adding or creating harms or traumas for other individuals so you know in your direct interactions with your neighbors or in your workplace at the grocery store that's social responsibility of not you know creating uh, any kind of harm or discourse in, around you you have control over you 
You can't control other people, but you can control yourself. So that's one That's one dynamic. The, the next dynamic or leg of the stool is social, response, social service. Mm-hmm. It's social service in the tech context of volunteer. Yeah. Get involved, you know, provide a service, whether that's feeding the homeless, um, you know, speaking, reading to children, volunteering at a hospital. It can be anything. Habitat for Humanity. Like there are a lot of nonprofit organizations in your local community, whether you're here in the Dallas area or you're anywhere, you know, in the country. There are different organizations that, you know, provide these community service type opportunities where you can actively be involved. I actively, you know, go out and 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 this is more on the civic side, but it is community service for me and help um, to collect signatures for, you know, uh, local judges to get on back on the ballot for the upcoming election. That is volunteer service. That's me taking, you know, time. And I'm very proud of this. I don't do it in and of myself. I also bring my daughter along with me so that she grows up with this, you know, perspective and thought process that I can be involved and give back. Um, whether that's feeding the homeless, whatever that may be, do something, right? That, that's my mantra, do something. And then the last piece is social justice and social justice in the context that we just talked about, Leslie, with um, our civic duty and civic engagement. So voting, you know, vote at the local level, not just for judges and sheriffs and the, and the like and city council, but, you know, the school district, you know, electors and and councilmen, like these are all things that have direct impact in your community for your loved ones or for your own children, you know, get involved and vote at that level as well as at the state level. Find out what your state representative is, you know, supporting for different laws that are coming up before, you know, the, the, the local or state level Congress. Um, find out what's going on and actively participate. You can petition and say, hey, this is the situation that's going on. They are your representative, right? <laughs> they represent you. They represent the community. So it's not, but if your voice is, and let me say it this way, if your voice isn't heard, and you're not actively engaged, then how can they know what to present, you know, present and, and, and push at the, you know, in session if the community is not openly sharing that information? They want to hear from you. That is their job. That's what they were elected to do. So please interact with your um, local state representatives and, of course, vote at the federal level. Um, I I never discourage voting at the federal level because, again, federal laws, if you can get something at the federal level, that applies to everyone. But not every law, not every nuance makes it to federal level engagement, which is why being involved at the local level, whether it's city or state, is very important. And that does have direct impact on your community. So those three legs, social responsibility is you as an individual, social service is you giving to your community in some way, shape, or form, and then social justice is your civic duty and civic engagement. Get involved. And all together, that's community social justice. That's doing your part, helping your neighbor, and then helping the, the entire country. And I love how you got your daughter involved because I think that's essential to get your family involved, get your kids involved. You're starting them at an early age. And I believe your daughter, she's a teenager, correct? Yeah, she's 15. Starting (laughs) at an early age saying, you know what, this is what life is about. This is what God wants us to do. I mean, it's about being servant leaders. It's about being selfless and being generous and being able to get out there on the ground and helping someone else live their dreams. And, And at the same difference, building up your community. And a lot of times we want to talk about our community. We want to down our community. And now my question always is, well, what are you doing about it? You know, <laughs> what are you doing about it? So Don, we're going to take a quick second and we're going to take a commercial break, everyone. And then we'll be right back with Miss Don Freeman back in a moment. Did you know that how you are perceived by others is a direct reflection of how you present yourself to the world? The brainchild of stylist Bobby Schwartz, The Iconic Style is the online resource for all women looking to up their style game. From learning how to address the challenge of daily dressing and building your essential wardrobe, to learning how to build your power wardrobe and dressing for success, The Iconic Style is the only website you'll ever need. We even do the shopping for you. Looking for a one-on-one consultation with Bobby? We do that too. 
Visit us online at theiconicstyle.com. Be confident, be empowered, be iconic. I want to talk a bit about diversity, inclusion, and equity. I know diversity is of any dimension that can be used to differentiate groups and from one another. And then we have inclusion. Inclusion is the organizational effort and practices in which groups or individuals having different backgrounds are culturally and socially accepted and welcomed. And then we have equity. Equity is the fair treatment, access, and opportunity and advancement for all people. And I'm really glad that you've included that with your company because I think it's something that we see every day in corporate America, we see it in our society all around, in and out of corporate. How can we as a society start having those conversations now, not just in a workplace about diversity and inclusion and equity, but I think the conversations need to start at home as well because it's the conversation that we have in our family, I call it at our kitchen table, with our children, with our spouses, with our siblings. What are the conversations that we need to start having now before we get into the workplace so that we're already groomed and well molded and ready to take on inclusion? Yeah, I mean, oh, wow. I mean, again, here you go, right in. Point, just smiling on the inside, I am. Um, you know, honestly, for me, it's exposure. It's exposure and getting out doing. Yes, conversations are great. So, you know, I could be educated. And it's so funny. I was talking to someone else earlier today. You know, you could be trained up the yin yang on all kinds of stuff, whether it's in the workplace or at schools. You know, you sit in, you get the little nice notebook for the day, and then you throw it to the side. You don't really consume any of that. It's just you went through the motions. But when it comes to cultural, racial, whatever dynamic, however you want to position it, you won't really truly understand. And, and even to get to the point of it being a conversational thing that you do at the kitchen table is you have to get out and interact. You know, one, one of the things, and, and, and this is a pet peeve of mine, and it may even be controversial, but one of the things is like, oh, you know, it's um, Black History Month. So we're going to highlight, you know, a great black, you know, um, African-American of what they did. But it doesn't really like showing highlighting one individual. That's great. But how about just talk to me? I'm right here in front of you. Right. I, I work with you every day. I go to school with you every day. You know, I may see you in the grocery store. We could just have that conversation directly so you can get to know me as an individual. And maybe I've reached the pinnacle of whatever accomplishment of the individual that we're highlighting. Or maybe I haven't, but I'm still here. Um, and it just takes engagement. Uh, and the same is true for our Hispanic brothers and sisters and, you know, our Asian American brothers and sisters or people of different faiths. Just talk to them. Go out and attend, you know, a cultural event. It, last month was Hispanic Heritage Month. And I know I saw a lot of memes on social media. Oh, it's Hispanic. I mean, okay, that's great. Now, let's go to a festival. Let's go to a celebration. Let's go and interact with the same you know, our brothers and sisters with the same culture and history so that, you know, we're not just seeing them in passing or celebrating or liking something on social, but we have a direct interaction and connection with with individuals. It, it's really hard, um, I would say, to really truly understand diversity, equity, and inclusion if you do not have in the people that's impacted or that you're trying to learn about in the room. You actually have to be involved and exposed to that to understand at a different level. Uh, I, I love to share my my personal experience of going to Africa for the first time, right? So I'm an African-American woman and you would just say, oh, you're African-American, so you, you get African people. Well, no, I, I didn't grow up in an African culture that I, I was Americanized, right? I'm from America. So when I went and had that experience in Kenya, it was so beautiful. It was beautiful to see their culture, what mattered, what didn't matter, how they celebrated, what was important to them, how they, you know, their style of clothing, why, just interacting made me have a different level of appreciation from 
for people that are living in Africa currently, and even for those that have moved to the United States to experience this, you know, free, the land of the free, right? <laughs> but them coming over, because their perspective of coming to America and our perspective of living in America is not the same. No. You, it's not the same at all. And things that, again, even though we don't have the best conditions as African Americans or brown and black Americans, you know, uh, in, in this country, we think it's horrible. Yeah. But for them on the other side, it is still a positive impact. And, and for us to go over there, we would probably see that, oh, okay, I'll never go, you know, I would never live in this condition. Right, exactly. <laughs> but it comes from involvement, engagement, to truly understand culturally differences. Being the same complexion as someone or being the same race or categorized the same as someone doesn't mean that you have cultural understanding. Being a picture, reading a short snippet does not equate to understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is interaction, it's active involvement, and having just general conversations directly with the people involved. One of the things that I, I so love about my children, and I kind of pick on my daughter because she's the one, she's still a mama's girl. The, the rest of them don't want to deal with mom because they're done. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get past about 17, Sorry, you know, they're mom, done. Yeah, mom doesn't matter anymore. Um, and they're boys, so that's a different story. But, you know, one of the things that I really love about how blessed I've been with how I raised my children, and most particularly with my daughter, is she's very, very open minded. She's very open-minded and she loves interacting with people of different cultures, backgrounds, and life circumstances. She doesn't have that, you know, blinders on no, that. Yeah. She had no tunnel vision. She is open to interacting with anybody and she's not judgmental and she wants to learn about and interact with different cultures. And that is a beautiful thing. You know, that only shapes her worldview and perspective at the next level. I, I had the blessing, you know, the blessed opportunity to be able to travel internationally with my children a few times. I didn't take them with me to Africa because that was a bit much. <laughs> but we do go on cruises. And in those cruises, we go to um, Mexico. We've been to Jamaica. We've been, you know, we've gone to Hawaii, even Hawaiian culture, right? They're, they're Americans as well, but they have a culture. Just a culture. Yeah. Right. Having that different worldview and exposure just does something to open your mind where you're not limited to just your street, your block or your neighborhood, but you have other things that you can reference and really pull from. And that really just cultivates a better understanding of the community as a whole. The community is not just one race or sex or population. It's everybody together. We all make the community. It's true. And, and, you know, and when we talk about culture and everyone's culture is different, even if you are the same, but different, you mentioned different complexions. Correct. And I think that when we talk about companies in corporate America, that's where there's a huge disconnect on culture. And that's why diversity and inclusion is so in equity is so important because in corporate America, not just outside of corporate, but in corporate, there's a really lack of education there from a lot of the higher ups and even the co-workers working together, not having an understanding of everybody's differences. And I think if we have an understanding, I'll, I'll break it down as simple as this. When we're working in a company and it's someone's birthday and they're from India, how should we celebrate that for them? Exactly. Should we take the time to learn how we should celebrate to make, if we're really going to make that day special for them, how do we make that day special for them? How do we make it special for an African-American? How do we make it special for people of all different, of all different cultures? And right. so when we, for any company that's watching right now, what would you say would be the number one reason that they should hire Fourth Don? and bring forth Don into their corporation so that they can begin having these conversations, but not just the conversations, as you said earlier, being able to put those conversations into action and begin to learn the culture of the people that they've hired within their company so that the company can continue to thrive. Because your bottom line, we all need to make a profit. But if we can make a profit within our companies, having a better understanding of the people that work for us, and they know that we care about that, look at the the longevity that we're creating with our employees and we're not having that revolving door of people leaving. 
what would you say to a company to get them to make this a urgent need that they should act upon? Yeah, ab absolutely. So again, love it, Leslie. I like, totally love it. Now, I, honestly, it, you know, in organizations, corporations and, and, and institutions just in general can be at different levels. So, you know, whether your organization already has a DEI, so diversity, equity and inclusion kind of organization or committee or even a department head, or if you have nothing, you know, it, it starts first with making the effort, right? Intentionality. And it has to start with leadership. One of the things that I have found to be true in my more than 20 some odd years, just working in corporate America, not just for one company, but in, in multiple instances at different levels within the organization, is that leadership buy-in and leadership education is really key. Um, because without that, you don't get the support and engagement that's necessary down to the entry level position. You wanna have you know, start with leadership, then go to mid management, then you're going to supervisory level and then to the workers themselves. But it's through example. So again, I, I, I just kind of go back to in all things, you know, it's modeling the behavior that you want to see repeated. So starting at the leadership level, before you, you know, if you're just embracing DEI for the first time, start with education and exposure within the leadership level first and foremost. Um, and, and, and just really looking at that, how bring in different speakers, but also look at the makeup of your team. You know, if, if it's all made up and it's not a judgment, it's just a reality. If the majority of your leadership team is all, you know, Caucasian males, then that kind of lets you know that there's been a lack of intentionality there. Um, and, and not to say that you didn't hire for the most qualified or best suited for the position. You, uh, We trust that you did, right? But again, bringing the value that is created by having different perspectives, different life experiences in a business setting, as well as, you know, for, you know, a uh, lifestyle setting, bringing that to the table only enhances your, your offering, your abilities to be able to impact the bottom line. It's also extremely motivational to your staff to be able to look and see there's a female in you know leadership there is an african-american there is a hispanic someone of hispanic descent or asian descent who is you know in our leadership team and, and that gives a level of pride and it gives aspiration inspiration yeah. for your employee base to really see that it is attainable and not unattainable for them because they don't look a certain way exactly. or they're not a certain race which they couldn't control anyway right exactly. yeah. Right. So, you know, it's starting with, you know, with the leadership level first, educate your 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 highest level leadership. Um, one of the things and Leslie, I know you're also a coach, but I'm also an executive coach um, and offer coaching services in support for the get ready for this for chief diversity officers and people that are overseeing these initiatives. You know, in, in a lot of instances, it may be one person who's trying to champion this particular committee or initiative within the organization. And it can be a tough role because it's not a priority. It, it may not be seen as a money-making, revenue-generating kind of activity. It's like, for the most part, some people see it as just a feel-good type thing. But it's so much more than that. And these individuals, um, you know, that are heading up these types of initiatives need that support. And that is something that Forfed On absolutely offers um, is supporting those individuals as they're championing championing that, that type of work and bringing that more diversity, equity and inclusion to the table, whether that's not just race, you know, and I know we spent some time in races, you know, unfortunately, an easy example to, to leverage. But when it comes to gender equality, Absolutely. when it comes to your LGBTQI, you know, population. Or a woman who's pregnant and having a baby. Exactly. Like there are so many different categories that, you know, of diversity, equity and inclusion that, you know, you may choose to focus on one 
two or all of them. But in all of those dynamics, it's bringing people to the table that, you know, have experience that, you know, storytelling is the best way, if nothing else, to really invoke empathy and express a need or really make it tangible for you to understand why it matters. It may not seem like a big deal at the end of the day when you're in back-to-back -back meetings and conference calls and emails. You know, it's easy to get caught up in our own day-to-day, -day, you know, kind of interactions and expectations as a leader. Right. But as a leader, we also have a responsibility to be present and visible to our staff. And we have a responsibility to do things that matter and motivate them. And even if it may be a small thing overall, it's a huge thing for your employee base to see that the company really cares and engages in that way. And we would absolutely love to help you either define that or perfect that um, as you're going through your journey, okay. your transformation. transformation. <laughs> uh, we're going to take another quick break before we conclude with the interview. I have a couple of quick, quick, quick questions for you, more Got personal it. questions and motivating questions. So give me a moment. Let me get to a commercial break and then we'll be right back with Don Freeman, everyone. Just one second. Hi, I'm Johnny Rodriguez, the owner of Johnny Rodriguez Salon. And I love partnering up with uh, Leslie O'Hara and taking care of our clients. Our main focus is to take care of women and their hair needs along with their beauty needs. We want to make sure that we get to know you from the inside out. We work with your lifestyle, not just your hairstyle, but your facial structure. Uh, we'll teach you how to do your hair, make sure you're confident in how to duplicate that look, and just to make sure that you feel as good on the inside as you do on the outside. So can't wait to work with you. Can't wait to come see you. Book a consultation or an appointment at either location in Dallas or Plano. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. I want to take a quick second and thank everyone for their comments today. We have Jesus, we have Georgia, we have Angela, we have so many different people commenting. And so thank you so much for your involvement and that they, Dawn, are enjoying the show and the segment with you today. So that's awesome. And uh, so here's what I want to ask you. I ask all of my guests this. Even when I used to have a television talk show in Dallas and New York, this is a very pivotal question. I remember asking Hollywood producer Lee Daniels the same question. They kind of threw him back for a moment. What is your I got it moment? I think the I got it moment is a moment in your life where you had a life lesson and maybe you had it, but it didn't really stick with you at that time. But now it's come full circle and you go, I got it. And it will stick with you for the rest of your life. What is that I got it moment and life lesson for you? Oh, yes, that, that's a beautiful question. My I got it moment was my life journey was never about me, but it was about what I can do and give to other people. And when I got it, when I figured that out, I had a sense of purpose. Um, it, it really made even struggles that I had in my early childhood and in teenage years, uh, disappointments and just things that I went through that just didn't make sense. Like, you know, sometimes things happen and, you know, people tell you, well, you got to move on even if you never get a, you know, I'm sorry or please forgive me or whatever the case may be. Or say a loved one dies unexpectedly and you have no idea, like, where did that come from? And you, you, you could be crushed by it. Um, but for me, when, when I finally understood and realized just from my personality to, you know, my skill set and talents, that it was all for the purpose of, you know, not just motivating other people, that's one dynamic of it, but to be authentic and transparent and sharing that with other people and just helping them, encouraging them to move forward, it just gave me such this overwhelming sense of just purpose and passion of, now I understand why I went through these different life experiences. What may have seemed like random and unfair and out of the blue, it really wasn't because it helped to shape me to who I am. And it gave me a story to tell, Absolutely. one that put me in a position where I can relate to other individuals, um, regardless to their background. It doesn't matter what 
position you've obtained, you know, you've been through something. Everybody has. Everybody has. And, and to be able to articulate that and say, hey, I get it. I empathize. I understand where you are or where you where you at, where you're at right now and where you're going and your journey. Um, and even if I hadn't had that direct experience, just being able to listen and but listen from the perspective of understanding their heart and the impact it had to them. So many times people don't listen right they don't listen we don't listen to each other and and there's something that you you get from listening but not listening just to the words but listening to the soul um listening to the unspoken words correct it's listening to the soul there there's something you can see especially in the work that i do you know behind the wall so in jails and prisons and just talking to people that are incarcerated and their words might be saying oh i'm okay or i'm getting out in xyz six months or whatever their mouth may be saying that but their soul is telling a different story and it may be heavy like for me sometimes i know you know i may leave those spaces and i just feel so burdened and heavy but it's because i can feel them i can feel their heart i can feel their anguish and confusion and fears and frustration and, and that's when i knew that this is what i was created for i knew it because i felt that way before and all I needed was just somebody else to get it. And yeah. What, you're such an amazing woman. Your last question, I have to ask you this. You have such a deep soul, a deep spirit, and just a wonderful light shining in you as well. What is your legacy, Dawn? You know, my, my legacy that ultimately I want to be seen as someone who's a great supporter. Mm -hmm. um, a supporter of people. Uh, and I actually had shared this on my LinkedIn earlier today. If anybody knows me, like if you know me, if you spent any time with me, you in any real capacity, you know that I am a supporter of people, sometimes to my own detriment um, and disappointed and disappointment. But I will support and, and, and go out on the limb and, and just try to make a difference, open a door. Um, for individuals. And so if nothing else, you know, at this stage in my life, being known for being a great supporter, um, advocate, and, and, and friend, um, and associate, it, it, I'll take that any day, all day. Some people want to be the top and I want to be the best at X, Y, and Z. And I can't really say that that's really my aspiration. My aspiration is just helping other people get where they're trying to be like that's so undervalued this day you know in this day and age but it's so necessary for risk takers leslie you talked about this risk takers and you know people that are aspiring to start a business or start a new job or have a baby or start a new relationship just having a support system with no ulterior motive, with no separate, you know, thing going on in the background, but just saying, hey, I'm here to support you. What do you need me to do? I don't have to be the headliner. I don't have to be X, Y, Z. I just want to be here to support you and your I effort. Help. Yeah. Exactly. How can I help? Exactly. Very good. Well, Dawn, I tell you, this has been a fantastic interview. I really thank you so much for taking the time to be here and enlighten us all on Fourth Dawn and everything that you do. And I hope that the audience that are watching, it has encouraged them, and I'm sure that it has just from the feedback, encouraged them to get out yeah. and to get out of their comfort zone and get into the community get your hands wet, you know, get your feet dirty, get in the, get in the, um, the trenches and yeah. make a difference in your community, make a difference in, 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 in the lives of other people. And I love what you said. It's about being selfless. It's about not always saying, I want to be here. I want to get to the top, but how can I help someone else get to the top? You know, how can I help? Cause there's room for all of us. And it's thank really you. about having a generous heart. I thank you for the heart that you have. I thank you for the hard work that you and your team do vigorously every single day in and day out. If you want to get in contact with Dawn, visit fourthdawn.com. I put up her different Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter pages. Uh, if you didn't catch that, it was up pretty quickly. Definitely, you can get in contact with her by going to fourthdawn.com. Dawn, again, thank you so much for being here today. And it's just been very inspiring to me as well. Awesome. Thank you all. I always like to do this. Hearts.
All right. Love it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back with Ask Leslie before we conclude the show. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a moment after the commercial break. Leslie, I want to take a moment first and say hello to Jason Cole. I see you. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for joining today. Uh, the first question with uh, Ask Leslie is Ashley from New York. She says, Dear Leslie, how long should I wait to date after recently going through a divorce? Well, you know, I'm coaching as a dating and conflict resolution coach. I, did, I coach a lot of women and I get this question a lot. I think a lot of times I see women, they are so anxious and so quick to get into the next relationship. I think you need to give yourself time to know yourself, give yourself time to embrace yourself and give yourself time to love yourself without having to step out of a marriage, going through a tumultuous divorce, which is hard for anyone to go through and, and being able to not have to give yourself to someone else so quickly. Give yourself to you treasure yourself and there was a back a second question you had to this was how do you enjoy life by yourself being alone well one of the first things to do to enjoy your life is not to think that you are alone you're not alone you're not lonely embrace a closer relationship with god embrace a closer relationship with getting to know who you are and start journaling writing down your goals what is it that you always wanted to do that maybe you weren't able to do when you were married really take the time Build a more closer, intimate relationship with God and build a closer, intimate relationship with yourself so that when God brings that next husband to you, you are so ready to give yourself, but you're ready mentally, emotionally, because you know exactly who you are. The next question is Tori from Boca Raton. Tori says, Dear Leslie, I am not in love with the partner, with my partner the way that I used to be. What can I do to fall in love with him all over again? You know, this is also a, a very frequent question. Tori, my question for you would be really kind of sit back and think about what has caused you to fall out of love with your partner, um, to lose that sizzle or that love in your heart that you used to have for him. Once you identify what that is, I always recommend being upfront and honest with the person that you're with. There's nothing like keeping something bottled up because no one can read your mind. Be honest with your partner. Share with them where you are in that space. Figure out what that is that's causing it. And then once you can identify what that it is, work together with your partner to figure out how to disperse that it to get it out of your relationship, to bring you back closer. But one of the first ways of getting to that next step of bringing that love back is conversation. Dawn and I talked a lot today about, um, and also the Let's Connect, the purpose behind this show, is about having conversations. But we can have all the conversations in the world if we don't have the intention or moving and putting action to that conversation, then you'll never find that love back. Have a conversation, figure out what it is, and immediately have those action steps to get back to loving one another again. I hope that helped you. We're gonna be right back for another commercial break and back in a moment. I 
like ending the show with the art of manifestation because I want to leave you with something that's so enlightening and positive to make you look at your life differently so you can be moved to immediately to take action in your own life. The art of manifestation is really about what it is that you want and thinking it, I say think it, drink it, eat it, sleep it, walk it touch it, feel it, you have to in order to bring whatever it is that God has placed in your heart that you want to come to fruition. You have to speak it every day. You have to put it into action every single day. If you want to write a book, 10 minutes a day, write something toward the book. If you want to start that business, even if it's just 10 minutes a day, start writing that business plan. Start taking that vision from here and from your heart putting it on paper and then immediately put it into action. So if I'm telling you to do this, here's some things that I want to see manifest in my life and that I'm not hoping, I'm not thinking, I am really manifesting and believing it to come to fruition. My goal is to have a television talk show on the own network one day. My other goal is to host one of the reunions that Will Packer and Tyler Perry does on the own network after some of their reality shows. One of my other um, goals that I want to manifest, us, I manifest, I want to interview Oprah Winfrey and Barack Obama President Barack Obama and Michelle one day. So speaking those things, it's just not water under the bridge. I have to speak it. I have to believe it. I have to walk in it and have the faith that it will come to fruition. I definitely believe in you. I thank you for taking the opportunity today to spend time with me and with Ms. Dawn Freeman, the CEO of Fourth Dawn today. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your time. We will be right back here next Friday, every Friday, 3 p.m. Central Time, live on Facebook, Instagram, as well as on YouTube. Now, today we changed the time to 4.30. Dawn was such an important interview. I wanted to make certain I did not miss out on that, and she has such a tight schedule, but we'll be back on schedule next Friday, 3 p.m. Central Time. Make certain to like my page on Facebook, follow me on Instagram, send me a friend request on Facebook, and also don't forget to connect with me on LinkedIn. And for all of the ladies, if you want to hire me as your dating coach or conflict and resolution coach, log on to uh, lessconnectrelationships.com. If you're looking to book me to speak at any of your events, definitely log to lesliohairmedia.com. And again, thank you so much for today's show. Have a great, safe weekend. Bye, everybody.